So I'm Victoria Stodden. I'm a statistician, and uh, this is, I feels like a room full of people from the natural sciences and uh, people from physics. Um, also, adding to that sense of alienation, I don't think I've ever been tasked with talking about a more difficult topic than truth, even scoped as it was in the description. So what I'm going to do in my talk is scope this a little further to a discussion of how we actually establish scientific facts, particularly how we're establishing them today, as um, a lot of our science is becoming more heavily computational and how this is affecting the way we think about and define scientific facts. Okay, so I'll go through the changing concept of a scientific fact, um, a brief survey that I did of the machine learning community as to, uh, that speaks to some of these issues that I'm going to raise earlier, and then I'd like to talk about some of the responses to issues that I'm raising that are happening in the scientific community, broadly understood, and raise open questions that um, arise in this issue and hopefully spurn some discussion in the audience. Okay, so I, st I, I, I was thinking about this trajectory of how we define a scientific fact, and uh, I traced um, issues to do with reproducibility and science as we might understand it to Roger Bacon. So he wrote a book, it was actually the third in um, an entire series, Opus Tertium, in 1267, where he advocates the verification of conclusions by direct experiment. This is the first um, real, real kind of approach to this issue that I could find. And characterizes experimental science by this verification, by its ability to discover truths unreachable by other approaches, and the investigation of the secrets of nature opening us to a knowledge of past and future. So there he introduces the notion of time and the notion that we may actually want to establish a scientific record, not merely for dispute resolution happening concurrently with our peers, but as something that we can actually take forward into the future um, as knowledge. So what he does is describes what is familiar to all of us, a repeating cycle of observation, hypothesis, experiment, experimentation, and then he adds this notion of the need for independent verification, and this will play an important part in the rest of my talk. The other thing he did that I found fascinating is he recorded his experiments. So one example that, um, that he used for this was research into the nature and cause of the rainbow, and what he did is recorded it deliberately in enough detail such that other contemporaries could actually replicate and reproduce his work. So this wasn't something that happened because he was you know, explaining a concept, he was really interested in this notion of reproducibility, and I think this is the genesis of this notion of reproducibility in how we establish scientific facts. Okay, so I racked my brains for some kind of joke that they're both named Bacon, but I couldn't come up with one. So here we are with Francis Bacon, 1620, so we fast forward about 300 years. Um, in a much more sophisticated approach to how we think about science and how we construct or understand scientific facts. So he also wrote um, an important book, Novum Organum, probably people are very familiar with that here. Um, so he talks about the gathering of facts by observation or experimentation. Before this, what was considered science had largely been what we would have called deductive reasoning. What's very familiar in mathematics, starting with axioms and then moving on to um, general principles. So this quote here uh, is essentially introducing this I an idea of inductive reasoning in the use of data and verification in scientific advancement. I'll read it for you. There are and can be only two ways of searching into and discovering truth. The one flies from the senses and particulars to the most general axioms, and from these principles, the truth of which it takes for settled and Im immovable. The other derives axioms from the senses and particulars, rising by a gradual and unbroken ascent, so that it arrives at the most general axioms last of all. This is the true way, but is yet untried. So what Bacon, Francis Bacon has done here is established the second branch of the scientific method, inductive reasoning. Before that, there was really only one way to do scientific reasoning. These discussions by Bacon were taken up by what became known as the Invisible College in um, England in around 1645. And um, I, I believe, I mean, I, I actually don't know, I wasn't there, but I believe that had something to do with the formation of the Royal Society of London, which was created in 1660. Um, the reason I mention this is because, of course, this is the very first scientific journal 
Uh, the society correspondence was reviewed, managed by the secretary, Henry Oldenburg, who apparently found this work onerous. He was writing letters back and forth, co uh, coordinating peer review and so on, essentially acting as an editor. And so what he did is became the founder, editor, author, publisher of Philosophical Transactions, launched in 1665. So there's the cover. Transactions giving some of, I'm assuming, accomplishments of the present undertaking studies and labors of the ingenious in many considerable parts of the world. So it's very lofty and beautiful. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, I'm going to advocate we're at a turning point again, possibly. Uh, that scientific research is again changing. Probably many of you are familiar with keynote speeches, discussions at NSF, um, editorials in scientific magazines, postulating a new third branch of the scientific method or even a fourth branch. So to get there, this is really a discussion about scientific computation. And I'm going to argue that scientific computation is changing how research is conducted in many fields. And it's also changing the nature of how we learn about our world. So two distinct changes are actually happening, and the second is reminiscent of Francis Bacon. I have a conjecture which is partly in humor and uh, partly realistic that today's academic scientist probably has more in common with a large corporation's information technology manager than with a philosophy or English professor. So pervasiveness of computation. So as a statistician, I looked at our flag one of our flagship journals, the Journal of the American Statistical Association, uh, from 1996 to 2011, I looked at the June issues of four years, and I was interested in, did they use computation in their research? And if they did, did they tell me where I could get the code and actually understand what they did? So in 1996, a little less than half actually used some computation. The ones that aren't using computation are mathematical articles. Nobody talked about where I could get their code or, or peer deeper into what they did in, those, in that computation. Fast forward 10 years later, 2006, nearly every, but 33 of 35 articles in that issue are using computation somewhere, at least in an example in the article. Now 9% are talking about where to get their code. After that, well, at least after 2009, every single article is using computation somewhere for something, sim at least simulation something. And we're still increasing the amount of um, authors that discuss where I can download their code packages or access their code, but we're only in 2011 this summer up to 21%, which seems pretty dismal. Um, when you think about the amount of um, intellectual steps that are taken in, pr in providing these results that are actually only embedded in the code and are not going to make it into the final journal publication just by space necessity of nothing else. Okay, a couple of other um, notes about pervasiveness. There's been a quant there is an ongoing quantitative revolution in the social sciences. Um, there was a note published about this in Science in 2009 by Lazier and a whole list of um, social scientists deriving from social network data that's revolutionizing the social sciences. Um, computation is reaching into areas where traditionally they haven't considered themselves computational. For example, at Northwestern, there's a project called Word Horde, and what they are doing is um, examining the distribution of word diction by Shakespearean play. And when you compare these, maybe we can get a handle on whether or not Shakespeare actually wrote these different plays. So now it's reaching into English departments, becoming a computational scientist. Okay, I'll go quickly through some examples, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, uh, many have argued that computational simulation, an example here is what happens in climate science, is a new way of gathering information about our world. We can do simulations of complete physical systems repeated, systematically varying our parameters as we go through. Um, climate science with these giant um, simulations is certainly a new way of gathering um, information. Another one many people are familiar with here is Large Hadron Collider. So the reason this is one of my examples is because of the enormous amount of data that's being produced by the LHC. And I'm going to foreshadow here with a quote from Rolf Hoyer, Director General of CERN, where he says, 10 or 20 years ago we might have been able to repeat an experiment. They were simpler, cheaper, and on a smaller scale. Today, that's not the case. So if we need to reevaluate the data, we collect to test a new theory or adjust it to a new development, we are going to have to be able to reuse it. That means we're going to have to save it as open data. So this is from 2008. So far, it's not open data. Um, 
many years later. But these are issues that even one of the biggest data genera scientific data generators are thinking about. Okay, another, um, another trans what I believe is transformation in how we approach scientific questions is in um, data-driven dynamical modeling. So this is a group, Andre Sally's lab at UCSF, they're modeling um, macromolecules, <coughs> protein folding. And they're doing this um, in a way that's data-driven from the actual folding of the molecules itself and very collaborative. The prime author here is not a biologist, it's a computer scientist who's um, doing this type of um, process modeling. Another interesting transformation is um, when we use computers to carry out mathematical <coughs> proofs, right? So this red box here is um, uh, uh, a figure from my thesis. And what I was doing here is I was trying to evaluate an algorithm and determine where it was successfully recovering the underlying model and where it was not. And there's a, trend, a boundary point in, in the phase transition in the diagram here. I also wanted to put a more modern version of philosophical transactions now, th I think 340 years later. So the, the open question is, if I show something mathematically through simulation, it's very different than adding deductive logic to a deductive system. What I've done is by definition bounded to um, the areas where I've actually been able to carry out the simulation and arguably perhaps I haven't increased our understanding the same way I would have if I had done a mathematical proof to understand where this breakdown point actually occurs. I mean, there's, there's a little more to the story in the papers, but understanding this as something that comes out of simulation, I think, is very different than understanding this as something that comes from mathematics and proof. Okay, so I'm gonna, uh, what I'm, my central thesis, I'm gonna argue that this is actually all evidence of a very large problem that's occurring in how we do scientific communication in the computational sphere. Relaxed practices regarding the communication of computational details is creating a credibility crisis in computational scientists, not only among scientists, but as a basis for policy decisions and in the public mind. So this reaches back to uh, Paul's discussion of Fire Abend and um, science being inherently a social activity. Prominent examples of what I'm talking about, people here I'm sure remember Climate Gate in November of 2009, and um, for all the, the political um, discussions that surround it, at core, it was really a failure of information sharing and people wanting to understand, well, what are the data that are driving these results? What are the models that are generating these results? How do I get in and really understand the conclusions and the results that are being discussed? A second example is our microarray-based clinical trials that were recently terminated at Duke University. You may have heard of this example as well. Um, I would like to talk, talk about this one in a little more detail because one of the salient issues was how journals actually communicated information and how they chose to um, amplify or suppress corrections that had been brought to their attention and how do these essentially disputes get resolved through the journal mechanism. If I asked anybody here, well, how do scientific disputes get resolved, probably the first thing you all would have said is, well, we have journals, right? They're peer-reviewed. If there's a problem in a journal paper, you publish um, a correspondence or a correction or you uh, publish a whole other paper that, that um, that's where the conversation takes place. There are deep problems with this as well, particularly in the, in the computational sphere. Okay, so to, to talk about this clinical trials case, um, what happened is Anil Poti and other authors at Duke published four very high impact and highly lauded award-winning papers in Nature Medicine, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet Oncology, Journal of Clinical Oncology, 2006, 2007. And what they did is they found evidence, or argued that they found evidence of um, how genomic signatures could be used as a guide to um, appropriate cancer drug treatment. This is, of course, something that once you publish things like this, people are going to be really interested in it, and other groups set to work trying to replicate and understand these results. And I note that these four papers now have all been uh, retracted, and I'll explain to you why. So at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, they couldn't replicate, um, I believe they started with the Nature Medicine, um, article, and they found very simple flaws that came out of problems in the computational work that had been done. Drug labels were actually flipped on some of the columns. 
um, genes were repeated and some genes were missing in subsequent al analysis that had been in earlier analysis and so on, and it looked like sloppy computational work. Now, that's interesting to me in a scientific communication perspective because none of that, of course, was picked up in peer review, right? Nobody really looks under the covers that deeply in peer review. They sort of are able to read the paper. This type of thing is in the code and in the data itself. So the folks at um, MD Anderson Canvas Cancer Center sent correspondence in a supplementary report to the Journal of Clinical Oncology based on this paper. Uh, publication was declined. 2008, Nature Medicine declines their correspondence pointing out these same issues too. Uh, based on this work, clinical trials were initiated in 2007 at Duke and Moffitt in 2008. Okay, but Duke was aware of some of these problems, launches an investigation in September of 2009, suspends the trials in October. In October, they also report the results validated regardless of the errors because, of course, these data were blinded. Digging in a little deeper, um, uh, they found the actual data was not itself blinded. So these, are, these sound like simple questions to answer, but determining whether or not data has been blinded, it's very detailed work. Um, so, they, so it was actually MD Anderson um, researchers as well who found that out. So they resumed the Duke clinical trials. Patients are ad allocated to treatment and control groups. So these are people with cancer, right? They're actually um, starting to be given the drugs based on things like flip drug labels. Duke says neither the review nor the raw data are being made available at this time. Okay, July 2010, so the entire biostatistician, biostatist, biostatistics community is watching what's happening in this case, right? Um, clinical trials are very serious, so it's not just equations on a paper or um, people in the ivory tower. So there, a letter is written, signed by 33 prominent biostatisticians to Harold Varmus in his position at head of institutes of medicine urging suspension of the trials, examination of standards of review of published materials and for clinical trials, including reproducibility of results. What's inherently missing in the problem here is that there's no way to actually replicate these results. When um, MD Anderson researchers tried to reproduce them, this is when they found the problems in the, uh, in the research. Okay, September, around September 2010, the IOM, the IOM created a committee to review, to, to basically do a review of omics-based tests for predicting patient outcomes in clinical trials, discussing this issue of reproducibility directly. November 2010, Poti resigned, clinical trials are terminated, so now it's the aftermath of lawsuits and, and so on. Um, but to me, this points to a very deep problem in how we actually review our work and to information that's missing when people are trying to peer review work, information that's in the code and that's in the data that isn't actually made available. Okay, so this is David Donahoe, who's actually my PhD advisor. He's a professor at um, Stanford in the statistics department. Uh, in a paper we wrote together, we argue that the scientific method's central motivation is the ubiquity of error, the awareness that mistakes and self-delusion can creep in absolutely anywhere, and the scientist's effort is primarily expended in recognizing and rooting out error. So if this is your frame about how you manage scientific communication, it seems like opening code, opening data for computational work is extremely important. Okay, so let's go back to the Bacons. Branch one, deductive reasoning. Theory, our mathematics, our logic. Branch two of the scientific method, um, Bacon two, inductive empirical work. Here we have our machinery of hypothesis testing, statistical analysis of controlled experiments. Now in branch three, large scale extrapolation and prediction using simulation and other data intensive models. People, many discussions that I hear, people just assume this exists and it's the third branch of the scientific method and we're in a new age. Um, as I've tried to point out, typically scientific communication doesn't now, for computational results, include enough information to allow researchers to independently replicate results, doesn't include the code and the data. Uh, I'd argue that most published computational scientific results today are simply impossible to replicate. So my thesis is computational science cannot be elevated to a third branch of the scientific method until it generates routinely verifiable knowledge l akin to the proof in mathematics and in deductive reasoning. So the sharing of underlying code and data is a necessary part of the solution enabling reproducible research. 
Okay, so I did a survey of the machine learning community to try and understand why this isn't something that's happening more readily, why, more readily, why there's this reticence and what the barriers are to sharing code and sharing data. So what I did is I surveyed um, anyone, any American academic who had gone to the Neural Information Processing Symposium, NIPS, which is one of the top machine learning conferences. I had from cold emails 134 responses filling out my web survey form from 593 requests. So I thought that was pretty good. Okay, so here's what's going on. The biggest problems are it just takes a lot of work to document and clean up my code such that I can release it. Uh, if I release it, I'm going to be plagued with people who can't install it on their system and have these problems and then can't, and I'm not an IT person, you know, I'm a scientist, I can't deal with that kind of, um, those sort of um, avalanche of emails that I'm going to get. What if I don't get attribution for this? What if people just take my code, they use it in their products, uh, in their research, or they take the data? Um, then what? I've just wasted my time, right? Very interesting to me, uh, I also have a law degree and then I've done subsequent work on this, but worrying about whether they can patent the code or should patent it or can patent it, uh, is, that fares is a big issue, so I wouldn't want to release the code if I'm thinking about patenting this. Other legal barriers like copyright also fare very highly here. So these IP barriers I've been doing for the last couple of years, a lot of work on relieving scientists of these IP barriers and streamlining and making this easier for them to share code and share data without these legal barriers that are, that are a problem. Um, other issues we have to release with, ad, with the admins. Um, I could lose future publications, I'll get scooped. This one actually surprised me on how low it fell in the group. Um, I don't want to advantage my competitors and I don't even have a place where I can put all my data. So the red codes for what I considered to be a self-interested um, reason, whereas the blue is these are sort of more global reasons not, not actually coming from <coughs> self-interested perspectives. Oh, and then there's also, of course, this reason, which I certainly, I certainly sympathize with. <laughs> okay, <laughs> anyway. <sighs> I think it's absolutely true, at least in my case. Okay. Um, all right, so here are the reasons, <laughs> here are the reasons that uh, these machine learning folks said that they did share their code and data if they did share it. Um, so again, the, the blue ones I consider to be sort of non-subjective or um, non-personally motivated criteria, whereas the red is their, their personal interests are at stake. So they want to share, encourage scientific advancement. They want to encourage sharing and others just be part of a community where this is something that's done. Uh, be a good community member, set a standard for the field. So this is arguably possibly personally interested if you are able to set standards in terms of test cases or um, uh, ways of thinking you can really kind of garner a lot of citations, right? Um, improve the caliber of research. Um, and then they want to bring other people in and work to work on the problem. Uh, increase their own publicity, get feedback on their work by opening it up more widely, and maybe even find some collaborators by sharing code, sharing data. Okay, so I don't intend you to read this slide, but what I want to point out is that these issues in code and data sharing and in reproducibility and computational science are being addressed um, across the landscape of computational science in independent ways. Applied mathematics perspectives, there's SIAM Geosciences, Biometric Society, uh, there was a session at AAAS annual meeting in February, digitization of science and reproducibility. Um, uh, ACM, uh, one of their conferences is now, has an option for you to have your work verified for reproducibility. There's also deep changes and lots of thinking happening at, particularly at NSF, but to some degree at NIH and DOE as well. Um, so I point to some reports that I was involved in, both of the top two, um, where they really are addressing these issues of reproducibility, of code sharing, of data sharing, of scientific communication, and of dispute resolution. Um, and this, but this is an ongoing um, discussion. Um, there's also changes that are happening at the journal level. I'm not sure if... Um, Journals that you regularly publish in, you've noticed these changes, but there are lots of changes. Like, for example, as of February, science now requires you, if you publish with them, to relinquish code and relinquish data to anyone upon request, right? A upon threat of retraction. Nature does this for data. They don't do it for code. And it's very progressive, and um, there seems to be something of a cascade effect happening from these leader, leader journals, where other journals are also requiring code and data, rather than doing just you know, we'll make your supplementary materials available or whatnot. So we'll see, these are brand new, brand new policies. 
Okay, I wanted to mention in the spirit of uh, public discourse and the larger discussion and the staging that Paul gave uh, to, the, to the discussion this morning, um, some of the things that have happened in the popular press. So you probably remember from December in 20, 2010, New Yorker published this um, article, The Truth Wears Off, where they postulated um, something mysterious is happening, there's some force that's, that's, that's in scientific research in the results seem to be very significant when um, new results are found and then as these are replicated increasingly the effect seems to become less significant. And um, I think a very telling quote is, he said, this is written by Jonah Lehrer, and he says, it appears that nature often gives us different answers, which I think is, I think he sort of threw it in there as a throwaway, but I think it's actually extremely deeply insightful as to where he's coming from in his writing of the article. Okay, and then they, they give several examples of where this seems to be happening. Okay, um, this wasn't so interesting to me because t when you think about all the, um, research that happens that's published that's computational or experimental in this case, um, this is a fairly small subset, um, but nonetheless, uh, interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm also curious, I wrote a very small question at the bottom here, is that we have, so um, Robert K. Merton proposed several scientific norms that distinguish scientists from other people in society. One of them was his idea of universalism, which embeds this concept of a bias towards the publication of results that agree with previous results. And this, to me, is still a mystery that I'm thinking about. So, and this has happened over and over there. So I've given you the two examples of Climate Gate and the Duke clinical trials, but there are many, many, many other examples of work that's retracted or the computational um, aspects seem to be flawed in hindsight and so on. Um, one of the things that's masked this is the more junior researchers or less famous folks who've done research that disagrees with previously published work can't get it published, and um, the previously published work that perhaps has um, computational flaws in it, and there are certainly cases of this, um, seems to sort of be accepted longer than it needs to be. Okay, another thing that happened in the popular press in the Atlantic in November of 2010, there's an article, Lies, Damned Lies in Medical Science, uh, profiling the work of John Yanidi, so now he's a, he, he has just recently moved to medical school at Stanford University. He has a background in statistics and in um, data analysis, and much of the, what the article is doing is talking about his work exposing bias and flawed statistical reasoning in medical research. Um, he postulates several reasons for the decline effect if it is real, which is this initial exaggerations of the results, there is just simply researcher error. Um, as a statistician who's consulted on a number of projects, you, I, I don't have the same standards for doing statistical data-driven work as, say, I would for, for someone who's fully trained in statistics. And then I think this is a more deep statistical problem, but there's a misinterpretation of p-values, artificial lowering of p-values. This certainly happens, right? Publication criterion is often just on p-value thresholds, and so there's a lot of kind of jostling around to get those p-values lower, and some deep problems in statistics that we're working on. Um, for example, cherry picking from multiple comparisons and so on. Pardon? Oh, okay, so p-values are if you have, um, if you do a hypothesis test, in some sense, p-values are giving you the threshold <coughs> at which you would see something that extreme or more extreme under your hypothesis. So it's a way of verifying um, whether or not the hypothesis you're postulating is probabilistically true. Okay, so this is my last slide, and what I want to do is open some questions that I've been thinking about that I'm worried about if we go forward with open code and open data, which seems very likely. Um, so what do we do about massive code bases? It's one thing to say I have some short scripts, and I can look at this, and I can verify uh, your results, and I can see that you didn't put magic numbers in your code, and you didn't sort of calibrate this in certain very crazy ways, which right now we can't see for pub published results. But if your code is hundreds of thousands of lines long as... Uh, is not that atypical for some of the work that's done. It's not even realistic that I'm going to be able to look at it. So um, to me, that speaks to more sophisticated methods of testing codes and understanding them through tests rather than through like, actual eyeballs. Massive data sets also a problem in how we share them. That's, of course, what's holding back LHC, right? or at least one of the reasons. What do we do when we release software? Set aside the barrage of emails about people who can't get it to work. 
Um, but what about when it becomes antiquated next year or the year after? Who maintains this? Who updates it? What if bugs are found in it as other people start to use it? Is of course th that will happen. Mm -hmm. And then how do these get fixed? And how do we develop mechanisms to perhaps even involve the larger community in an open source software style in scientific coding? We don't, we're not doing a very good job of doing that right now as scientists. What about sensors and streaming data? What does reproducibility mean in that context? Uh, one of the things that I think is going to be key in resolving this is the development of tools to um, facilitate tracking what was done in, in a computational experiment and then sharing it. So these are often data provenance, workflow tools. Um, I.J. Good has a quote from 1958, progress depends on artificial aids becoming so familiar they're regarded as natural, right? So we can get around that first barrier where it's just really hard to go back in your experiment, kind of in some sense recreate what happened in the code, put it together in a way that isn't completely embarrassing, and then put it out there, right? So if we can, if we can make that a little more streamlined and easier for scientists, I think this could really solve a lot of the problem. Um, the next point I coined the Taleb effect. So Nassim Taleb divided, um, he had a sort of a quadrant diagram on scientific dis or mathematical discoveries and how they could be used effectively or ineffectively. Um, uh, so what about when code as a tool, I mean it, it, code is tools, is shared and then this is used by people who really don't understand what's going on and um, then what happens and this is, this is one of the reasons that some software, scientific software developers don't want to share their software more widely or they want to have a permission system where they vet you in advance and so on because they think it's just too easy to apply this to data in an uninformed way and produce results and if this is something that it, it has in some sense public engagement behind it that's something to be careful about and think clearly about. Like public misinterpretation. Okay, um, I think I've discussed black boxes, opacity. Um, uh, I'm also thinking about the brittleness of software. So as we embed more and more of our deep intellectual contributions to computational software in code, does that perhaps coupled with the fact that, as we all know, if you've ever tried to run a small program, it's very easy to break it, very easy to have it not run. Um, does that perhaps make it more likely that we'll rely on these ideas that have already been coded up just because they've been coded up, not because they're necessarily better? Um, making it easy to sort of hit return with code and data and regenerate results, does that discourage really independent replication? going out, even recollecting the data and rerunning everything independently to see if you can get the same results. One question I'm often asked in talks is, well, what are you even talking about open code and open data for reproducibility? That isn't even science, just hitting return. Science is when you do the replication independently. That's when you're actually contributing to knowledge. So are we discouraging this by opening code and opening data? And the final point is um, what I alluded to earlier in that there are big discussions happening now at the policy level, even in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, um, and even across Europe. Um, I don't see necessarily scientists engaged in these issues and um, policies are gonna be made, so I think it behooves us to find support for our norms in a policy context rather than allowing these rules and regulations to be set without, without our input or with minimal input from a few interested people. All right, I'll stop there and, and take questions.